Hi everyone, this is Joke van Dam, and I'm so excited. Today I'm chatting to Liesel Tom. And Liesel, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, I would love to just introduce you to the audience. Liesel Tom is a journalist, talk show host, producer, and author. And as, as if all of this isn't enough to keep her busy, she's also a qualified master life coach, master transformation coach, neurolinguistic practitioner, and inner conflict therapy practitioner. Liesel really helps people examine, question, and change the stories they tell themselves about themselves, which liberates them from their fears and limiting beliefs and helps them harness the power of change. Liesel was trained as a life coach by internationally acclaimed coach and author Martha Beck. She also trained at the Transformation Coaching Academy as a coach. She's received several international awards and has coached con contestants on two reality TV shows. Thank you so much for joining me here today, Liesl, right at the beginning of the year. And um, today we're going to be chatting a bit about media because that's really what you are so strong in. And I wanted to ask you, if a business owner wants to build credibility, or let's say it's a marketing team from a company, why are media interviews important for that? Yuka, thank you so much. You know, the media is so pervasive. Even if you have a radio on in the background, your subconscious mind takes in all that information. And if you hear someone's name over and over again, it creates sense in you that A, you know that person and B, you can trust that person. So when your name gets mentioned repeatedly, on media platforms, it builds trust and it builds credibility. Because second of all, also people won't invite you back on their show if you are not deemed trustworthy and credible. I love that, I love that. So, so you're saying it's in the subconscious mind when a person hears your name multiple times that that trust is really getting built. But how about a person that has never been in media? How do they get the attention of a television show, a radio show, a podcast? Like, what would your advice be to speakers, business owners that for the very first time now want to reach out and get some publicity? Yoko, we live in the most amazing times where they are a myriad of platforms. There's not only the traditional mass media platforms like radio and TV, but we also, like you mentioned, have podcasts, you have YouTube. There are so many possibilities for anyone who has something to say to get their voice out that it's basically a matter of picking your poison. So if you <laughs> decide for 2023, I want to get my name out there. I want mass media recognition. I want, I want to use the media to get my brand or my name out there. I would start small. Go to your local knock and drop newspaper if you have something to say, and this, Yoka, is the basis for any successful media interview, you have to have something of value to share. Because the media, you know, people have all these ideas and these highfalutin constructs about the media, but the media is basically medium for communication. So when you have something to say, something that can add value, something that can help people, that message needs to come across. So if, you, if you've never done any media interview, start small. Go to your local community newspaper, community radio. You know, we so often overlook those small community radio stations, but they have a very loyal listenership and they have a far bigger reach than we would imagine. So start with your community outlets and contact them, tell them what you have to offer. And then if what you have to offer is deemed valuable, they will invite you. So if, if you, you don't get, sorry, Jürgen, sorry. If you don't get that invite you want, 
we, we live in a day and age where you can then record your own podcast. You can record your own YouTube and you can distribute it on social media platforms. So there are 110 ways, if you feel strong enough about your message, getting the message out is the least of your worries. I love that. Thank you. So if I can summarize, you're saying even start small, look at community radio stations, community knock and drop newspapers, places like those, get it magazines. Who should they then contact, Liesl? Should they contact a specific, the editor of the magazine or maybe look at a features editor or, and if it's radio, is it a producer? Like who's the type of person they should get in contact with? If you are looking and radio is my first love and, and where I've spent most of my, my career in broadcasting. And if you are looking at radio, I would suggest you speak to the producer. So often people think that it's the presenters that have the final say. And yes, some of our presenters are very involved in their shows and they very, um, they co-create and collaborate with their producers to, to, to make that show wonderful. But at the end of the day, the producer is the one who makes that call, who, who has to do the planning, who, who has to, to make sure there's enough time in that show for what you want to say. So contacting a producer is a very good idea. Find out who the producer is on the show that you would want to be on. It's no use if you want to be on, let's use Bruce Whitfield's show on, on Cape Talk and 702. It's no use if you want to be on Bruce Whitfield's show to contact the producer of the morning show. Although producers are very nice people, you might be lucky and the producer of the morning show might be able to give you the number for Bruce Whitfield's show. But contact, find out, do a bit of homework. And that homework is not just about getting you that interview or landing you in that hot seat. That, that homework and that research you have to do also is part of your preparation because part of your preparation for a media interview is you have to know who you will be speaking to, what you will be speaking about and what their style is. Now we have some journalists in our country who have a very abrasive style and they will question you and and it's one question after the other and you might feel like you're being in court being being questioned by a prosecutor other journalists have a far easy easier going demeanor so find out who will you be speaking to and prepare yourself with that in mind I love that. So really understanding the, the style of the person that will be interviewing you so that even if it was almost like comparing it to a job interview, who is this type of person? Are they going to be hardcore? Are they going to be more relaxed? Should you be more jokey? Should you be very serious? Should you actually be preparing for the worst type of questions they can ask you? In the preparation for this, um, Liesl, how... How easy is it for the person that's being interviewed to kind of lead the producer or the presenter into the topics that they want to discuss? So if I say I want to speak about um, the power of public speaking, how would I, would, would that already have to be in the first phone call that you actually pitch to them to say, I really think public speaking is important to your target audience, you know? Or does that come in through the emails later or just before the interview? Where, where does the, the topic come in? Well, Yoka, if you are doing, an, if, if, if a journalist or a public figure is doing an interview with you about a certain topic, it is because you are the expert in that topic. And as the expert in that topic, you definitely lead the discussion. 
Obviously, a talk show host or a journalist will ask you questions, but their questions have to be informed by information that you give them. So no broadcaster, no journalist will go on air not knowing what the topic is and what potential questions they will ask you. But also bear in mind that even though the journalist might have questions worked out beforehand, your answers might give them another question. They might ask a follow-up question. So a conversation while you might plan it, you as the expert might have an idea where you want it to go. You don't really have control over whether it will be going in that direction. And that is where certain tricks come in very handy. Now, one of the first things that I learned when I was working in talk radio is redirection. <laughs> if someone asks you a question and you either have no idea what the answer is, or you don't want to answer it, or you think it's not relevant, then you redirect that question. You might say something like, Yuka, that's such an interesting question, but you know what I find more important than anything else? And then you take the conversation in the direction you want to take it. I just want to remind you and, and your listeners that any interview is a conversation. Communication is a two-way street. There's no point in just talking to yourself the whole time. <laughs> so the person interviewing you will have a definite in input on where the conversation is going. But you as the expert, you drive it. I... I love what you're saying, Liesl. Thank you so much for these amazing insights. I remember at the Professional Speakers of Southern Africa, you spoke for us um, there in August 2022, and you um, you got up and you're speaking about being a, your own superhero, and you wore a red jacket, and you spoke about the psychology of color, and you said something about red is not necessarily the best color to wear in front of an audience what are important colors to wear if you are doing a tv interview or a youtube interview like how does the colors actually influence how people perceive you it's absolutely true that there is this notion that the colors we wear have an impact on our audience. And you'll see I wear blue. Blue is the color of communication. But the first thing above anything else, make sure that you are comfortable. If you have a shirt that makes you feel fantastic about yourself, it boosts your confidence, forget about the color. You wear that shirt. Yes, red does come across, can come across as very aggressive, but it can also come across as lively and vibrant. So red is, is a tricky color. You have to think about it, but red is also very beautiful. It draws attention. So if you want to play it safe, wear something blue. Blue is as I said, the color of communication, turquoise. Turquoise is the color of mass communication. If you are not sure, wear something that is one color. Don't wear patterns um, unless it's that one shirt that makes you feel like you can conquer the world. When you do TV interviews, ask the producer whether white is a good idea or not because some cameras especially the older cameras create patterns when they have a, a plain white it, it creates like a chromalin effect so ask the producer they will tell you personally i don't think white is a good idea for any interview because especially us ladies we don't want to look bigger and we all know that white makes you look bigger 
black does slim you down. However, it can make you come across as very distant, cold, emotionally detached. So again, ask the producer and look at other interviews on the show you are hoping to be on. It comes back to do your homework. I love that. I never knew about the turquoise is for mass media. That is so interesting. Sure. I wanted to ask you if a person is now in the TV studio mm. and um, it can probably be quite intimidating in terms of lots of cameras, lighting, lots of people there that's not necessarily part of the interview. Where should the person that's being interviewed look? Should they be looking into the camera? Should they be looking at the interviewer? What, what would your recommendations be? In general terms, you look at the person speaking to you. It is not your business where that camera is pointing. <laughs> it is the camera's, cameraman's business and the cameraman knows what he or she is doing. You are having a conversation with the presenter or the, the, the journalist. So have that conversation, make eye contact with that person. If they want you to look at the camera, I promise you, they will tell you to look <laughs> at the camera. But it's, it doesn't happen very often that a guest will look straight into the camera and speak to the audience. The cameraman or camera woman will position the camera to catch everything on your face, all those nuances, all those micro expressions, but you look at the presenter. I love that. Thank you so much. If we're talking radio interviews, um, sometimes people are being interviewed over the phone and sometimes it's in studio. If it's um, from home, what would your recommendation be for the person to get set up? What will be the best location or, you know, set up for them to have the least amount of noise? What do you do if you have a radio interview that's over the phone? The first thing you do is you make sure you have a very good phone connection. Now, it is a problem, especially with load shedding. Our phone connections are not as good as we all may, always would want them. But go to that spot in your house where you have the best connection. Or if you can, get yourself a booster. If you look here behind me to my left, there's a booster because cell phone signals mm. are not always strong enough. You can get technology to make them better. So my first thing would be make sure that you have the best cell phone connection or a landline if you can, the best telephonic connection you can. Then you start working with the ambient noise. If you are in a situation now, it very often happens, especially with lawyers, for example, who are at court and it's a noisy area. Pop in your earbud, put on your, your, your cans, your microphone with your, your earphones with a microphone. Do whatever you can to limit the noise as much as possible. And then speak a little bit slower than normal. Because if there's a lot of background noise, people have to concentrate and focus to block out that noise. If you speak too fast, then some of what you are saying might get lost in translation, so to speak. That's very, very helpful. In the same way, I wanted to ask you, um, I think ever since COVID, I've noticed that a lot of the TV interviews have just happened at home and <laughs> something really disturbing happened. You know what I'm talking about, where a lady has something really bad in the background of her shelf. Um, what, what should people look at in terms of setup for if they're being interviewed from home? If you are doing a visual interview, 
from home using a platform like Zoom, my first, and this is one of my bad bears, Yoka, is when I can see, and I'm going to change my camera for a moment, but where you can oh, see the oh. ceiling, I want to have a fit, and it happens so often. I am not interested in looking at someone's ceiling. I want to look at the person. So make sure that behind you, there are no distractions. You can have a plant. Now, normally on this cabinet behind me, I have photos, I have crystals. I've taken them away because they distract people. So make sure that your background is interesting, if you can, don't just sit in front of a white wall, but don't make it too cluttered because that distracts. Then if you are doing it from your laptop or your computer, lift the computer. My, my laptop is standing on a box to make sure it's the right height because you want to have the camera, that little green light, the, on, the, on the screen, you want that more or less in line of sight at the, at the height of your eyes, because that is, if you look into that green light, you are looking straight into the camera. Having said that, it gets really creepy if someone sits and stares at the camera the whole time. We don't, when we speak <laughs> to each other, we don't speak like that. We look at the person. So I am right now looking at your image. Then I look at the camera. Then when we think I look away. So don't stay at the green light. It makes you come across as creepy. But be aware that it's there because that is, that's the eye of the person you are speaking to. That's amazing. So really, Lift your, lift your camera so that it's higher. Make sure that your background is not distracting, maybe not too boring, but it's not going to be too cluttered. And don't just stare and be creepy, but rather alternate your gaze in different places. I found that to be very, very helpful. I wanted to just ask you from a journalist's perspective, if you were interviewing someone, what can that person do to make your life easier? The first thing I would say is decide beforehand what the three most important points are that you want to bring across. Very often, we speak to people with loads of fantastic content and wonderful ideas. But if you are, for example, doing a radio interview, chances are that that interview is not going to be longer than three to five minutes. Now, if you have seven or eight wonderful, amazing points that you want to make, you're not going to be able to squeeze that into three to five minutes. So decide what is the most important thing I want to bring across, what's secondary and what comes after that. And decide beforehand which of all your wonderful ideas and salient points are the most important and stick to them. Because that, you know, let's face it, Jurka, Doing an interview is not something that most of us are very comfortable with because we haven't done it so often. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get, the more it becomes second nature. But especially the first few times, you have a physiological reaction. So your heartbeat increases. You start sweating. You have this negative self-talk that keeps on this, you know, this little inner critic that keeps mm. on jabbering away. Yeah. Now, with all of that, you still need to make sense. So decide what are my three most important points and have the information to back that up. You can have five, but make sure that you know which two you can throw away because 
We don't want our interviews to become too vague, too general, or too cluttered. I love that. So three main points. Back that up, have first, second, and third most important thing that you can talk about. And then I what I've struggled with, and I think this is because I like talking too much, Lisa, <laughs> is, is how long should your answers ideally be when someone is interviewing you? They are two absolute polar opposites. The one, the one kind on the one hand of the spectrum, the one kind of interviewee will give yes, no answers. And I have to say that is the most frustrating of everything. If you're trying to pull information Ugh. from someone, that becomes very hard. It's, it, and it doesn't make for easy listening. The other side of the spectrum is someone who talks too much, who gives too long an answer. Now, if we look at those three points that you have, and if you give an answer, that's too long on your first point. You are not, you, you stand, you risk not getting to your other points. So if you want to, if you want to get to the sweet spot of exactly the right length, not too, too little information, not too much information, I would personally say between five and seven sentences. Now we don't count our sentences when we talk. I'm not going to sit here and think, okay, so I'm going to give you an <laughs> answer. This is one sentence, that's another sentence. So it is something that you kind of get a feel for. The one secret I learned years ago about an, a successful interview is you always want to leave people wanting more. So rather, if you are someone who tend to over-explain, who tend to overshare, rather cut yourself short, make sure that you've said the most important things and colored it in a little bit, but then stop. If your interviewer wants to hear more, they will ask you for more. It's very difficult for an interviewer to manage time if someone gives too long-winded and elaborate answers. You are really good at that in terms <laughs> of keeping it to the minimum, closing it off nicely. I can really see your, your media expertise coming through beautifully. Thank you so <laughs> much, Liesl. I think like we've learned so much today. If I can summarize some of the top things that stood out for me, you were saying, don't discount the smaller media houses. Go and speak to community radio stations, newspapers um, that's in your community. Pitch for those. If you can't get in, do your own. So do your own YouTube interviews or podcasts and Possibly, could you possibly then use that to actually get into like a radio station if you had to send them a snippet of an interview you did yourself, Liesl? That is something that can be used. Yes, absolutely. Because once the, if, so if you're a producer for, let's say, a radio station and you are not 100% sure whether your talent should be doing this interview, if you have an example, if you can listen to this person speak, that would immediately give you that gut feel, yes, or maybe not this time. I once sent a, a producer of a radio show, a talk that I did at Disrupt HR, and when I met the, the presenter at the radio station before the interview, he said he watched it and it helped him. So I totally agree. It shows them that you do have knowledge and that you are an expert or have the credibility to speak about a specific topic. Thank you so much for today. Last question I have for you is, what is a plug? A plug? Jürgen, now some of these terms, I know I might not look at, 
but I have been in this industry for longer than I would like to say out loud. <laughs> so a plug is one of those new terms, but from oh. what I understand, it would be to say at the end of an interview, uh, do a little bit of self-promotion. So I see you shake your head. So that gives me the confidence to say that I am kind of on the right track. So I'll, I'll throw out a plug and say that I do help people prepare for media interviews. And as part of that, we also do a few mock interviews where I also go from very calm and collected to doing a relatively good impression of Deborah Pata, just to make, pe to, to give people that feeling of what it feels. Because remember our bodies, the more used we are to a specific sensation, the less attention we pay to it. So if you are used to feeling this little bit of discomfort before your interview, then your interview is likely to go very well. Whereas if you are not used to it, that discomfort might overwhelm you. And Yurka, just last word from me, one of my very first interviews on radio, I was not really prepared. I, I, I've been doing news for a couple of years, so I was absolutely prepared to do news, but I didn't realized they were going to interview me about the, ha the, the what happened in court that day. And as the presenter asked me the question, I could feel my heartbeat going faster and faster. I could hear my heart in my ear. And when she stopped her question, leaving space for me to answer, I blanked out. So it does help to have a little bit of practice before the time. So if that situation has to happen to anyone else, and that can happen, let's say they haven't gone on your media training, which they then will immediately do afterwards, but let's <laughs> say it's that situation and they've completely missed the question, what would you recommend them to do? I think a very good way to buy time and to give yourself that little bit of extra time to formulate an answer is to ask for the question to be repeated. You could say something like, I'm not sure I understood you correctly, or I'm sorry, there was a little bit of a break in the line. Could you repeat the question, please? And then add it with that. And it's something I said earlier, speak a little bit slower than normal, because that helps your body to relax it tells your body, of course, there's breath work and all kinds of things. But when we speak slower, we feel more in charge. And that gives us just that little bit of a boost that we might need at such a time. Amazing, Liesl. Thank you so, so, so much. I'm sure that all of the listeners will really enjoy this. Such gems from a radio, TV and even all other types of platforms that you could actually invest in your self point of view. Thank you so much for your beautiful insights. And I look forward to chatting you with you again soon. Thank you, Jürgen.